I'm a member of the class of 2001, and I serve on the Alumni Council at St. Anselm College. I'm also on the Hartford Regional Alumni Network. It is my pleasure to welcome you today to today's webinar, The Best Books for the Worst Times, Reading for the Summer That Wasn't, presented by Professor Megan Cronin of St. Anselm English Department. The college is committed to keeping our alumni and friends engaged by offering webinars, podcasts, and social media events. The variety of programs offered this spring has been extremely impressive, and I encourage you to contact our Office of Alumni Relations with suggestions for future programs. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the college's website for those who couldn't make it live today. Professor Cronin will speak for about 25 minutes or so, and then we'll take questions. There is a Q&A button on your screen. Please feel free to submit questions. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Dr. Megan Cronin. She specializes in Romantic and Victorian literature. Her published work focuses on the novels of Thomas Hardy. She also writes on the 20th century British writer, Antonia White. Dr. Cronin has lectured at the Thomas Hardy Society Conference in Dorchester, England, and at the Gerard Manley Hopkins International Summer School in Monastraven, Ireland. She has been at the college since 1993 and currently serves as the director of the college writing program. I know Professor Cronin was one of my favorite professors and I know is the same for many of you. Now I'll turn it over to Meg. Hi everybody. Um, I'm going to share my screen in a few minutes, um, but I would just want to say hello and thanks for coming to the webinar and to hear more about books, which is one of my favorite things to talk about, as you know. Um, after that nice introduction, I have to say two things. Um, one, wow, I have to update the website because um, I, I was recalling the past as John was introducing me and the things that I've done. And I'll tell you a little bit more about my more recent research when it becomes relevant during the presentation. Um, but the other thing I want to say is back to John that he was one of my favorite students. <laughs> so, and that's true of, I don't know who's all out there today, but I just have loved my time at St. A's so much. And I always tell my current students that um, being with you guys is the best part of my life, right? I have my family and my friends, and then I have the rest of you who I've been in class with. And it's truly, truly the best part of my life, those things. So I just want you to know that. Um, Today, I'm going to talk about great books, things you can read this summer, and I'm going to share my screen right now. Um, here it is. Uh, and I'll do the slideshow. And hopefully this works. Does that, is everyone seeing Patrice's? How does that look? It's good? Okay. So I talked, um, I called this propose, I call this presentation, the best books for the worst times. And I said to Emily in the alumni office, you know, you can change the title if it's too depressing. Um, but she's like, let's go with it, right? And I called it reading for the summer that wasn't, right? So what are we going to read this summer and uh, amid the, a very different summer than we may have expected? Um, so uh, my first, the first thing I wanted to ask or ask rhetorically is um, sort of like, what, what's a great read? What's a great novel? Um, how would I want to spend my time reading this summer? So I have a whole bullet list here of things we might call a great novel. We might, we might not all agree on what a great novel is. Um, so I said, first and foremost, a novel that's entertaining. Entertaining, maybe beautiful, artistically excellent, you know, for that reason alone. And we have to always remind ourselves that art doesn't need a reason to exist, right? Art is just beautiful and entertaining and pleasing. A great novel might be truthful, serious, and revealing. Uh, it might be innovative, experimental, or breaking new ground. Great novels can be exciting, evocative, and moving, maybe provocative. Maybe they are very demanding of us. we we'll are talk a little bit about that today. Um, maybe a great novel is disturbing and it makes me uncomfortable. We've been hearing that word a lot lately about being uncomfortable and, and asking uncomfortable questions about our lives and who we are and our, our communities. Um, a great novel can be teaching and stretching for me and expanding our horizons. Maybe a great novel is epic, human, and powerful. And uh, the great paradox of art, of course, is that it can be both intimate 
and universal at the same time. How does this work of art that I'm reading or viewing or f watching on film, how can it speak so personally to me, but also seem to be about everyone and all humanity? It's the, as I said, the paradox of, of art. Um, so this summer we may or may not be on the beach, but we want some good beach reads. And I said, what's a beach read? What if there's no beach? Um, so, you know, beach read is kind of a, a joke phrase, right? Like, oh, you know, do you read, are you, am I going to read this? It was just a beach read. Maybe it's a book where it's a guilty pleasure, right? It's a book we're ashamed to admit that we read. And I don't buy any of that. I don't think we should be ashamed to read any book. Um, but, you know, the beach, the beach read trope, right? It, maybe it's a book that takes a lot of time to read. So we wait until the summer. Maybe it, maybe I want time away from work or time away from the regular hassle to think more deeply. Maybe it's just harder to think about this book. Um, maybe it's a book I'm going to treat myself or, or push myself to a book beyond my regular reading habits. Um, I'll try a new genre. Uh, I'll, maybe I'll read a book with a friend. Some of us have been doing this during the pandemic, right? Where we can't go to a book group, can't get together in person, but maybe you and a friend or you and a family member read a book together. Um, maybe a book that's just fun, right? Totally different fun. Um, a book that might teach me something new, right? The same way you might learn a hobby in the summer or go someplace new in the summer. Maybe a book that teaches me something new. Maybe a book on your nightstand that's been waiting for you, right? You have a pile of books there and there's a book that's been waiting for you. So maybe you're going to find that book. Um, or maybe a book from a new list. Maybe I haven't read a classic lately. Maybe I haven't read a fantasy book. Um, maybe I haven't read a book about Black Lives. Um, so maybe a book from a new list would be, these are all good beach reads. Um, so my husband reads fantasy and my daughter reads fantasy and I don't. Um, so the other day or a couple weeks ago, he, he gave me a book called, uh, he loaned me his book called um, A Song for Arbonne um, by Guy Gavriel Kay, who's an important fantasy writer. Um, and he said, Re please read this, you're gonna love it. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I wanna waste one of my books on a fantasy book. Um, and I gotta tell you, it blew me away. Blew me away, I'm thrilled that I read it. So, so I hit bullet, the last bullet, a book from a new list for me. Um, and I deeply enjoyed that book. Um, so we agreed, I, uh, the alumni office and, and I, we, we agreed that we're gonna do this talk in two parts, just because there are so many books to talk about. And today I'm gonna to do three or four categories. And then in a couple weeks, in about a month, I'm gonna do three or four more categories. Um, so the first category I thought I would talk about are great contemporaries, challenging books by, challenging works by living authors that I might recommend. Um, I have to, wait, I have to move my little list of people here so I can see my whole screen. All right. Um, you know, contemporary writers, people who are still alive, right? Who are the great writers who are either just now writing, maybe they're new and they've, they've won some awards or they've gotten some notice um, through the innovation or the artistry of their book or the importance of their book's topic, or maybe they're people who've been writing for a very, very long time, right? So, and again, of course, every list is flawed because no list can include every great thing, as we know from rankings. Um, so here I have two of the greats, right, who are still alive and still writing and have written very, very recently. Um, we have Margaret Atwood. And some of you probably read The Handmaid's Tale, or maybe you watched it on Hulu and then you went back and read it. Um, so Margaret Atwood has just come out with The Testaments. Uh, it's the sequel to The Handmaid's Tale. So to me, that means it's probably 25 years after the original, 25, even almost 30 years after the original. Um, you know, it would be more like 25 years, right? Um, and she also, she, she's written, I've given a list here, but this is just a selected list. Uh, she also has a novel that became a play and that's called The Penelopead, which is about Penelope during um, when Odysseus is away, what is Penelope doing? Um, I mention this specifically because in a few minutes, I'm gonna talk about the current trend for rewritten classics. And I know some of you may have taken humanities um, and you remember that first unit. So um, I wanted to mention those. The other great I chose to put here is Michael Chabon, um, who started with the Mysteries of Pittsburgh. Um, his most, probably most well known is The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. Uh, and he most recently wrote Moonglow, which of course became an important film as well. But all of his books are very uh, critically acclaimed and award winning. Um, so we'll move on to, how about some new, new other new greats and old greats? Um, very new, we have Angie Thomas, The Hate You Give. I know many people read this book, or maybe your child read the book um, in high school or in college. Um, the Hate You Give is about a drive-by shooting at a party. 
Um, and the, auth the, the narrator is a, is a young black woman, and that's Angie Thomas's first book. Um, we have Viet Tan Yen, who's written The Sympathizer, which is a novel about uh, Vietnam. Again, uh, uh, who sort of, he sort of plunged into fame with this book, and he'd written a lot of uh, short stories, et cetera. And it's a very important new book by a young, young great, I'll call him. In addition to the previous screen, I have as our old greats, we have a few, and I tried to give an array of things that might interest various people. Uh, Colm Tobin is the Irish writer who's written many books that some of you have probably read, um, including the master Nora Webster, Brooklyn and the Testament of Mary. Um, Brooklyn is very good and that also became a film you may have seen. Um, Nora Webster was also one of the most popular. Marilyn Robinson is a living writer who's written, a, a, we'll say about four novels, a couple other things. And she's one of these writers, unlike JK Rowling, you know, unlike people, who, Stephen King, who are cranking out books all the time, she spends decades. Uh, she has spent decades writing the, sort of this saga story. The, the three, uh, the, the second three that I list here, Gilead, Home, and Lila are all the same story. I mean, a story about the same family, a minister, um, and sort of the, the dynastic story of his family and his generation. So these are some of the greats, great contemporaries I want to introduce you to. Um, we have some others who focus on historical fiction. I know a lot of people really love historical fiction, so I have two to offer here. Colson Whitehead, of course. Um, Nickel Boys just come out in paperback, by the way. Um, it was in hardcover last year. He wrote John Henry Day's Sag Harbor, which is set in Long Island, Underground Railroad, and Nickel Boys. They're all about the Black experience in America. And they are all, I would say, um, surrealistic, or I'll say almost realistic, maybe with a tinge of uh, something else. Uh, for example, so in Underground Railroad, there is an actual railroad under the ground, right? So he writes the story of, um, uh, escaped slaves and uh, uh, other people being able to leave the South on the Underground Railroad. He writes a historical story, but it has this surrealistic element of a train that goes under the ground. Um, and that's one of his most important books. Some of you may like reading about Henry VIII and the Tudors and Anne Boleyn and that whole history. And Hilary Mantel, among many other novels, she's written that story, beginning with Wolf Hall, Bring Up the Bodies, and then about a month ago, The Mirror and the Light came out, which is the third in that trilogy. And again, this is about the Tudors. Wolf Hall begins with the story of Thomas Cromwell and Henry VIII. Um, this trend I was talking, I did a few things on this, on this screen. I did, uh, we could call it sort of great women contemporaries, great female contemporary writers. And in part, I noted this, um, this interesting trend of rewriting the classics. So we have Circe by Madeline Miller, and she had also written The Song of Achilles. I know many of you may have read these books. Um, it was, Song of Achilles was very important and very popular. It is, uh, it's the Iliad that you remember from Humanities. And she, she rewrites uh, sort of a retranslation and a rewriting of The Song of Achilles. And then Circe is a follow-up to that. Over here on the right, we have the same story, um, The Silence of the Girls, um, also a rewriting of the classic Homeric text. This is by Pat Barker. Pat Barker, unlike Madeline Miller, who's very young, Pat Barker has been writing for, for many decades. And she's probably most well known for her World War I novels, uh, uh, Regen the Regeneration Trilogy, which I would also highly recommend. Um, some of you may have read My Brilliant Friend, um, or seen the series or begun to watch the series. Um, Elena Ferrante uh, writes this ostensibly fictional work, which may be based on her life. Um, it's a series of novels we call the Neapolitan novels. And the reason I'm sort of hesitant in describing this is because no one knows who Elena Ferrante is. Uh, we know her name. Uh, her exact identity is not known. Of course, it's known to her publisher, but um, she has not made herself known uh, and not much is known about her biography. Um, and the books are sort of beautiful and chilling and detailed about Naples. Many of you may have read uh, Donna Tartt's The Goldfinch or seen the, the uh, film, 
Um, so I put that there. Donna, Donna Tart also read, uh, she wrote The Secret History and, and The Little Friend. And then Little Fires Everywhere, I've just heard, is a new series, a new miniseries on TV um, by Celesting. Um, and that was a, a great novel also. So up to this point, I've listed a lot of things that I've either read or I want to read. These are on my to read list. And um, knowing that it's hard to choose such books, uh, as I continue, I'll try to distinguish between the ones I've read or haven't. Um, and John, if, if people have questions or if you want to say anything, you can sort of pop in. Um, whenever, you know, when you're an English teacher, you get a lot of the same questions all the time, especially, you know, we'll say party talk. Um, and some of those are things like, I guess I better watch my grammar around you. Um, I don't really like that one because nobody has to watch their grammar around me. Um, you also might get, gee, I hated English. And I just say, oh, I'm sure you liked something else better. I don't know what to say when people say that, but that's okay. People don't have to like English. But also sometimes you get this question, who's the greatest writer of all time? Or who's your favorite of all time? Or who's the greatest 20th century writer? So knowing that I can't talk one-on-one -on -one with all of you, I thought I'd take a stab at that question and I cheated. So I'll say that in 2006, um, the New York Times asked 125 living writers who the greatest writer of the past 25 years was. So 2006, 25 years back from there, they were allowed to choose writers in that period. And they voted um, with a significant majority. Uh, they voted for Toni Morrison as the greatest writer of the past 25 years at that point in 2006. So here she is, Toni Morrison. Um, I, I believe if you're readers, you've probably read at least one of these books. Um, Beloved, of course, is the most well-known and the most chilling um, Song of Solomon, Sula, the Bluest Eye, uh, most recently, God Help the Child. But um, I certainly recommend, um, if you haven't read a Toni Morrison novel, um, they are beautiful, deep, disturbing, uncomfortable, gorgeous experiences. So that's a recommendation of one of the greats. Um, I also like to give the nod to other faculty members and things that they've done for me in terms of reading. So let me mention that Professor Malieko, Bindu Malieko, who some of you may know from the English department, she has converted, I'm gonna, I don't know, maybe half the faculty at the college. Uh, who knows? Uh, she, she's, she, her, she has evangelized for this Indian author, Rohinton Mystery, and she's gotten many of us to read his novel, A Fine Balance. That's the third one listed here. And it's about um, Indian, uh, people living in India and all sorts of class. It's, it's almost like a Dickens novel, right? It's, it's, it's urban. It's many, many classes, you know, tens and tens and tens of characters. And it's elaborate and vivid and realistic and, and gorgeous. We even had a senior do his senior thesis on it two years ago. Um, and she's, she's done a great job evangelizing for him. And I would, I would refer to him as one of the greats. Uh, sometimes people say, I want to read a classic. Which one should I read? Uh, that's a very hard question. So I'll try to, try to offer you a few. Um, and maybe you've read some of them. Um, so on this screen, and by the way, uh, if, you spend a, if you spend time on Wikipedia and other book sites, you can actually find original covers. I'm really into original covers and graphic design. I like graphic design. Um, and uh, the, the internet, uh, some internet sites have done a very good job of collecting original covers um, of different editions of novels. Um, so um, if I had to pick a classic, if you haven't read, I'd say Pride and Prejudice. Jane Austen called her novel her most bright and sparkling. And indeed, she's right about that. I had a senior read it a couple, uh, several years ago, maybe four years ago for a senior thesis. And um, he said, you know, I'm so glad I read this. It's been on my grandma's night table as long as I've known her. And I just thought it was a grandma's night table book. Uh, and he, of course, was, was delighted to read this delightful novel. Here I have an illustration from Great Expectations. This is when the prisoner is taken, which happens in chapter one. If you know the novel, you know what I mean. And um, when I recommend a Dickens novel, I often recommend Dickens' Great Expectations, um, which is uh, dark and um, disturbing, but it is also a rollicking romp of a story. 
if you've read Jane Eyre or if you expect me, the Bronte scholar, to uh, recommend Jane Eyre, sure, I recommend Jane Eyre. But I also recommend her sister's novel, Anne Bronte's The Tenant of Wildfeld Hall. I just finished teaching the Bron a seminar on the Brontes in our previous pandemic semester um, to 14 students. And this is always our favorite, The Tenant of Wildfeld Hall. And takes a lot of risks. Her sister had to defend the coarseness of the novel to reviewers because she depicts domestic violence and alcoholism very vividly. And she's the first woman writer to do so. She, I should say she's the first English white woman writer to do that. Um, and I also recommend Elizabeth Gaskell's North and South, which is an industrial novel um, in that genre. American classics, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recommend four. Among many others, of course, it hurts to only recommend a few. I'd say Twain's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, which if you haven't read it since high school, read it again. Um, it's, it's, it's much more philosophical and serious and chilling than you remember, although it's also still as funny. Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man is a stunning, important piece. I don't know how many of you remember Professor Lucas, Ilona Lucas in the English department. She used to teach a course on Willa Cather. Um, My Antonia is always the favorite, most beloved Willa Cather novel. And again, I highly recommend it. It's set in Nebraska. It's, it's beautiful and amazing story. Um, in the category of how about a second book by an author you've already read. If you've read The Great Gatsby, try Tender is the Night or This Side of Paradise by F. Scott Fitzgerald. The classics also are filled with horror and sensation, if that's your thing. My students in the Gothic novel class adore Wilkie Collins novel, The Woman in White. It's a mystery, it's sensational, it's scary. Um, I highly recommend it. It's one of my favorites of the 19th century. We also have, of course, Dracula, and the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I think that if you've heard of these novels and you haven't read them, you'll be surprised by what they're really about and what's in them. Um, we have Country Novels by Thomas Hardy. Tess of the D'Urbervilles is probably the favorite. It's a tragedy. Um, Anthony Trollope, if you like religion and politics, I recommend Anthony Trollope, The Way We Live Now. Irish Classics. Uh, I would recommend um, the Country Girls Trilogy by Edna O'Brien. This, this is an author that Professor Anne Norton, who is now Anne Holbrook, uh, her scholarship is on Edna O'Brien. Um, if, if you know about James Joyce and you haven't read him, start with The Dubliners. And then, of course, the weirdest novel of all time and one of the best is The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. Enough said. You have to read it to, under, to, to believe the experience of it. But Meg, what are the biggest, best books of the whole entire 19th century? You have to pick some. I'm going to pick Middle March by George Eliot. She's a woman, by the way. Bleak House by Charles Dickens. And I am currently reading Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy. I'm te team teaching in the fall with Professor Pajikowski, Philip Pajikowski, a course on Tolstoy. And I am rereading Anna Karenina. I was sitting on my deck two days ago and I said to my husband, Mark, I think this is probably the best book I've ever read in my life. And he said, what? How, can you say that? I said, I think so. I think Anna Karenina is the best book I've ever read in my life. And I'm pretty sure it is. So take that with you and think about it and pick up Anna. Um, I know that we're, we are also reaching into literature to learn and empathize and just stretch ourselves and, and reflect on our knowledge of Black lives. Uh, and we want to do that through the eyes of, of people who, Americans who experience lives as Black people in America. So my subtitle here is Reading to Learn, Understand, and Reflect. How can fiction teach us important things about culture and society? Uh, we could talk for an hour about it, but I'm going to make one claim instead. Um, by creating characters and telling us their stories through their own voices, fiction creates empathy. 
And it puts us in the bodies and in the places and in the minds through point of view of characters. And we can actually experience being someone else, someone who we're not, and we can feel their experiences and hear their emotions. So let's look at a few of these. Um, Edwidge Danticat, I must not have finished the slide. She's a Haitian author. Um, she wrote Breath, Eyes, Memory. Um, and several other novels, Farming the Bones is my favorite. Through Farming the Bones, I learned about something called the Parsley War between the Dominican Republic and Haiti, which I had not known about. And it's a genocide, essentially, of Haitians by Dominicans. Um, it's, a, it's, believe it or not, a beautiful story. So this is Edwidge Danticat. Um, I'm gonna read Chimamanda Adichie's Americana this summer. This is on my summer reading list. I have not read it. Uh, it's an important book that's gotten a lot of press, um, and I'm going to read this book this summer. You may have already read it. Many of you have, I'm sure, heard of it. Um, but let's go a little bit earlier and talk about some earlier novels about the experience of Black people in America. We have Cain in 1913, and may maybe you don't know about Cain. Uh, Gene Toomer wrote this novel in verse. It's pretty much almost all in poetry. Um, he was a writer who, when, when he wrote this novel, which is sort of shimmering and gorgeous, he became associated with the Harlem Renaissance um, in the 1910s, 1920s in New York. And he didn't really want to be associated with anything or any movement or anybody. Um, he, uh, his father is mixed race. His mother is mixed race. He is mixed race. He, uh, he refused to identify as either black or white. He thought that those identifications were both limiting and uh, they were labeling. He would fill out various government documents. Sometimes he would write black, sometimes he would write white. Um, and he tells the story of black people in America um, just after slavery. Some, sometimes, some of it reaches back into slavery. And it's, it's, it's a very, it's an interesting and innovative novel and I learned a great deal from it. Um, you may know Their Eyes Are Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. She is an author who's also an anthropologist and she had become unknown. We had lost her. She had become lost and her works to us until actually, uh, though a few people knew about her, specialists in, in the area, um, it was Alice Walker, who the, the novelist, Alice Walker, who wrote The Color Purple, who, who went and found Zora Neale Hurston, found her grave, brought her works back to be re-edited and republished. Um, so pretty much we had only had a few editions of her works and their eyes are watching God is Beautiful. Uh, Native Son by Richard Wright, another important book about a crime committed by a black man and what happens to him because of it. Um, I want to move a little more quickly. I'm currently reading Stamped from the Beginning by Ibram Kendi. Dr. Kendi was just hired by Boston University as an anti-racist professor, a, the head professor of their anti-racist uh, program. It's the definitive history of racist ideas in America. I've started reading it. It's about a sim segregation, assimilation, and then racism, and how those three things are related to each other, and I'm, I'm learning a great deal from it. For a novel, I'd recommend Sing, Unburied Sing by Jessamyn Ward, who also wrote Salvage the Bones, and I'm going to read her novel this summer as well. You may have heard of ta Coates' Letter to His Son, Between the World and Me. It's nonfiction. It's a book he wrote about his son, about being in a black body. He, it's Dear Son, sort of here, here's what your life will be like being in a black body, and here's what my life has been like carrying around a black body. His new book just came out, The Water Dancer. Um, some new voices, Taye Selassie is Ghanaian and Nigerian. Her new book is Ghana Must Go, and Brian Washington is from Houston. He writes about Houston, and he has a new novel, but this book lot is a collection of short stories. Um, that is the end of my brief run, fast run through some great novels you could spend your time with. And part two is going to be about summer travel and time travel, different countries, eras, and cultures. It's gonna be about education and adventure, award-winning nonfiction. And it's gonna be about Catholic fiction as well, faith, doubt, and the challenge of Catholicism, depicting Catholicism in fiction. So those, uh, I feel like I've been talking very fast about many things, and I would really love to have a conversation now with all of you. So Great. I'm going to stop we, sharing my screen. <laughs> we, we actually do have um, some questions rolling in, Dr. Cronin. They've been run, rolling in since the beginning. So um, I guess we'll awesome. just go. I hope I can answer. Yeah, I guess we'll just go um, one by one and see, see what you can do. Uh, the first question uh, from an anonymous attendee is, what are your thoughts about uh, Diana Gabaldon and her Outlander series. Oh my gosh. 
So I didn't read the Outlander series yet, but it's on my list to read. And I partly it's because I confused it with another book. This is not the time for embarrassing family stories, but my husband used to watch this weird time travel show called something like the Outlander. Highlander. It was called Highlander. Sort of this magic historical guy from medieval Scotland. And I thought those books were about that guy. And <laughs> Like, I didn't like that, so I didn't read it. But then one of my students recently set me straight and told me I have to read it. And also I saw one of the, there's a program about it. There's a movie or something uh, or a series. So I'm going to read them and I'm glad you like them. That's great. All right. Um, the second question is, are you a fan of Rebecca? Um, well done. Rebecca by Daphne DiMario. I am a fan of Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. As I said, I'm a Bronte scholar and um, Rebecca is often called kind of a, I, I don't want to demean Rebecca. I wouldn't want to call it a spinoff or a sequel to Jane Eyre, but it's a book that sort of was created, uh, du Maurier creates it out of the idea of the mad woman in the attic or the secret wife. Um, and I sometimes teach it in my Gothic novel class. I think it's a beautiful novel, um, modernist and impressionistic. And I love the way it's written. Highly recommend. Great. All right. Well, there's a question here, and I, I guess I'm going to add to it, too. So an anonymous attendee said, are there any books you can suggest for young readers, high school students? My daughter is a rising senior and would love to give her some suggestions for summer reading. And I guess the only addition I would have for that, and maybe it's a little tougher for you, but you, you had kids, too. You had kids once, too, I should say. <laughs> um, yeah. I have a nine-year-old, and what should she be reading these days? So oh, high school. Uh, you know, I, um, my daughter is 21 and she's mad at me already today because she wanted me to have several slides about Shakespeare because she's a Shakespeare person. She studied Shakespeare in her college. Um, it blows my mind that she's 21. I thought she was like five, you know. I know. She's 21. <laughs> my son just turned 24. It's good. A stop it, John. <laughs> But she, she's, she loves YA fiction, and she uh, is sort of a great connoisseur of it, and we read a lot of it together, as does my husband with her. So off the top of my head, but I, I also plan to make lists for people so I can make a better list. Um, we, of course, we do love John Green. So I would say if the, the person who put the question about high school, high school, perhaps the high school student might find herself a little too old for John Green, but I think John Green writes about really important issues um, in a beautiful way. Um, I recommend a writer called Maggie Stiefvater, and if I have a time, I'll type it into the chat. It's Stiefvater, um, and she writes a series, the book started with the Raven Boys, um, and the Scorpio Races was another one, and uh, she writes a series, they take myths, she takes myths, and they're not necessarily the most well-known myths, and most of them are not Greek myths. They're uh, Anglo-Saxon, English, Arthur things, and also other sorts of folklore. And she brings them to a contemporary period with sort of a group of friends. And I, I think they're, they're amazing books. Uh, Cornelia Funk is a writer many people like. Um, classics, classics like the ones in the question that I would recommend. Um, I think if your daughter's a great reader, she might really like the picture of Dorian Gray. I mean, it is bizarre, but high school students really do enjoy it. And they also find a lot of the African-American novelists uh, deeply moving and, um, as I said, expanding, expanding of their horizons. Uh, but I will make lists for everyone. That's great. I know they will love that. Um, all right. So we have uh, another kind of high school related question here. Um, it says, if you had to pick between the classics that are typically read in high schools, The Great Gatsby, Catcher in the Rye, To Kill a Mockingbird, which would you suggest that teenagers read? So I'm picking one, right? I think so. I think they're okay. Me. Okay, gosh. Um, <laughs> wow. I think I am going to pick. I'm sorry to answer like this because I know people are going to say, oh, boo, right? I'm going to pick The Great Gatsby. I'll, and I'll tell you why. I am a sucker for beautiful prose. If the words are beautiful, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm overcome. And I think the, of those three, The Great Gatsby has the most beautiful writing. I also have taught it a lot. A lot of seniors return to this for senior thesis. And I've learned so much about it beyond high school. I've really thought a lot about Nick. 
Like, why is he so complicit? Why does he allow this stuff to happen and just sort of hang out and do nothing? Um, but I'll also say that the To Kill a Mockingbird is different from the film. Um, and it, it's an excellent novel. It's a great piece of American literature. It's not just a great novel, a film with, with Gregory Peck, although it is, of course, that. Catch in the Rye is a favorite of mine. Some people hate Salinger. My husband is a Salinger scholar. My husband loves J.D. Salinger, and he would recommend other ones by Salinger, too. Um, so I would say let, you know, pick that one and see if your what your student thinks of Catcher in the Rye. They might hate it. I mean, some people think he's just a whiny and acts like a baby all the time. You are like, get over yourself, hold it. Um, and other people really like it. Right, and I think, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird is just so timely now, too. Yeah. Um, and it lent some very interesting discussions at the high school level. Right. Yeah. Well, right, it can be controversial too, right, John? Because we, we love Kiss. Yeah, yeah. But he's a white savior, right? I mean, it's like he, he takes, he's the leader. He has to be the one to fix everything, this important white man. Um, and so it's, it's important to discuss these depictions. That's true, that's great. All right, all right, let's see, you got some more. Um, let's see. If you have not yet heard about author Riley Sager, he writes thriller novels, great reads. I think that's just a recommendation, you know, to the group. Um, oh, good. Recommendation there. Um, aside from Bleak House and Great Expectations, what are some of your other favorite Dickens novels? My favorite of all is, besides Bleak House, I'll say two. I'll say, for fun, David Copperfield. But how can a thousand page novel be fun? Um, <laughs> You know, I tried, to do my my, I tried to do my senior thesis on that, Professor Cronin, but wow. it, got, it was a little too long to have uh, to Oh, have I would have let you do it, John. I would have <laughs> let you do it. Uh, my joke to my students when I assigned David Copperfield is, it's a thousand pages, but it reads like 500. And they, they don't think that's funny. Um, <laughs> but uh, David Copperfield is, is just, we love him as a young boy. We fall in love with him. Um, we identify with him. He's this hero worship. Part of the plot is a hero worship plot, and we've all done that. Um, I would recommend David Copperfield. But then, uh, you know, Dickens gets very dark after 1850. Um, and after Bleak House, my favorite would be Our Mutual Friend. Uh, it's a river novel. It takes place on the Thames. It's, it's, it's dark and compelling and complex um, with a lot of sort of social characters that you will recognize. Great. Looks like we have one more that's been submitted. Um, have you read um, In Darkness and Confusion and the Harlem Riot of 1943 by Ann Petrie? There was an um, op-ed in the Boston Globe about it today. I have not read it, but it's on my list to read. Um, and I didn't see the op-ed today. I'll, I'll, I will look that up um, because I'm always looking for, for new things like that. Um, I noticed Brendan O'Brien also posted a few recommendations and comments about the relevance of these novels. So thanks, Brendan. I agree. Hope you're well. That's great. Well, just a reminder, their Q&A uh, button is there if anyone has any other uh, last questions. We still have a little bit of time. Um, I have a question, kind of a, a selfish question here as a high school um, teacher. Do you find this, um, you know, distance learning and teaching novels and teaching writing to be more challenging? And, uh, you know, how do you do it? Because I know in your classes, I remember, you know, discussion being such a big part of it. And, you know, sometimes people don't feel as open, you know, on Zoom. And I'm you know, just wondering how you're handling that. Yeah, um, I, I really appreciate the question and the time to talk about it. Um, I, I, I tend to go over time, so I, I, I was worried about that. So that's why I didn't have more on my PowerPoint. But um, the question can be related to reading novels because, uh, you know, if we make the question a little more specific, how, how can we possibly do distance learning, remote learning, when students are, you know, supposed to be reading a novel, you know, how can I keep them going through this novel and without me dancing around in front of the room, telling them how much I love it all the time. Um, and, and I'll say, John, I, I was really worried about it. Uh, um, I, I was teaching two classes in the spring. I was teaching that Bronte seminar I mentioned, and I was teaching introduction to literary studies. And if some of you are English majors, you might've taken that class. For intro to lit, um, we had just finished our short story unit and we were just moving into Shakespeare. We did Merchant of Venice. And I thought, um, oh my God, I'm gonna lose them. So it was a, a class of non-majors and 
some of them had read one Shakespeare before in high school. And I thought, you know, the language and just everything going on and, and plus the transition to distance learning and being thrown off your campus. I thought this is going to be a disaster. We did a great job with it. We talked about Merchant of Venice. Um, John, I had discussion posts that they, that they had to contribute to. And I found that students who tend to be quieter and might not jump into a verbal conversation, given the opportunity to write their thoughts and, and, and the, on their own time, they can sort of comment on someone else's thoughts. Uh, students really blossomed. Um, I would occasionally jump in with a little question you know, about like someone would comment and I would say, oh, well, can you tell us more about your thoughts on that? And we really had some very rich questions on uh, conversations online. And I will do that again for other classes. Um, we also, I, I learned from a lot of my colleagues at other campuses and at my campus, sometimes I would put a passage, passage, John, I would put it on Google Docs and I would highlight different parts of it in different colors. And all the students had to annotate or comment on a piece of the passage. So say a difficult passage or a thoughtful passage, um, and they would have to sort of translate it and describe the meaning and unpack the language, just want, just maybe two sentences. Um, and, and that was really helpful for them. They really got into that. Um, and then the Zoom sessions, I ran like a book group, right? I sent questions ahead of time. Here are the questions we're gonna talk about on Zoom. Um, and we ran it as a conversation. I had different students lead the conversation. Um, our novel in that class, which I should put on this list today, was, um, um, it's escaping me now. Oh, If Beale Street Could Talk by James Baldwin. That was the novel I taught in that class. And the students, they were blown away by it. It's, it's an amazing 1970s novel. And it could have been written yesterday. Um, it is, you know, this happened before the George Floyd incident. I taught this book before the George Floyd incident, but of course, within the context of everything that's happened. And so it's a 1970s novel about a black, a young black man who's accused of, of raping a woman when he was on the other side of the city at the time. Um, so it worked, John, we made it work and everybody learned. That's great. Well, you actually can't get away that easy. We do have more questions rolled in That's there. okay. <laughs> Happy to do it. We have a couple more, yeah. So uh, one, uh, I guess we'll just go as they, in the order they came in. Um, it says, I have a rule that if I give a book at least 100 to 150 pages before I give up, what do you suggest if you can't get into a book? Great question. You know, I used to be one of these people who would never put a book down. It was a point of pride. But you know what? Life's too short. Right. I, I've now I've, I've grown out of that sort of silly vanity. Um, so I, first of all, I tell my students, um, I love your 100 to 150 pages. I think that's great. Um, I tell my students a few things because of course they have to read long novels and they might not have chosen them themselves. They do it for classes. And I say, first of all, you might read a novel at bedtime, but don't start a novel at bedtime. Right. Don't start a novel when you're tired. At least, you know, book out an hour for yourself to do that first delve into it. Right. So to give yourself that respect and that time to spend, I usually say 30 to 40 pages if you can. Now that that's very long, maybe for some people, depending on what you're reading. But um, so I think not getting into a book sometimes is when you read the first five pages over and over again. Um, I think also. Um, Give it up after 150 pages if you can know why that you're not into it. Um, don't be hard on yourself. Don't shame yourself. Uh, pick up something similar. Ask yourself if maybe there's a better time to do this. Um, you know, we, had, we saw a lot of articles during the pandemic, you know, don't shame yourself if you didn't pick up a new hobby or like build something during the pandemic. It's hard to get through this. So I would say, don't be hard on yourself. There are many more books that are worthy of you too. Great. Um, here's a book club question. Um, book clubs are popular, especially now. Everyone's doing them even via Zoom. Um, for a book club with different preferences on novels, what one book would you suggest that a wide variety of people would like? Well, a book that I've been suggesting a lot lately, and I'll talk about it next time. Um, I have two answers. This is one of them. Um, I've been talking a lot about this book called The Sparrow lately. Um, it's by Maria Doria Russell. And my husband calls the book Jesuits in Space, if that gives you an idea of how wild it is. Um, 
it is a novel. Um, it is a space novel, right? So some evidence is found of life on another planet, maybe in another universe, and a bunch of a group needs to go and find that out. And actually the church, the Jesuit, the Jesuit order decides they, they can do this. They have the money and they have the scientists and they have a linguist. So this, that's how the story begins. And it's a novel that actually asks every important human question. Sort of, did God make us? How did he make us? Did he make us good? Why are we bad to other people? Are there other people like us? What does it mean to be human? So I talk about that book a lot. It's, it's not heavy. I mean, it's heavy, but it, it's not heavy to read. The other book I would say is the one I just mentioned. It's short. James Baldwin, 1970s, If Beale Street Could Talk. Um, it is not, um, I mean, it's political, it's a social issue, but it's not partisan. Um, Baldwin was an activist and he wanted um, people to understand the lives of black people. Um, and it's, it's very short, very easy to read and beautiful. And I think everybody would like it, like to talk about it. Great. Okay, well, we have a little bit more time. So we have a few more questions. Um, as a college teacher myself, curious how you get students motivated when they find a novel boring. So I'm sure you've dealt with that one or two times. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think reading a novel for school can be what makes it boring. So I try to flip that around and make reading the novel for school to be the thing that makes it interesting. So um, uh, I'm probably, I, I'm sort of not being very clear here, but what I mean is that, you know, a novel takes a certain amount of time to read. And so often we have several days to spend in the novel. And it's not that we have to have a sort of line by line, point by point conversation about the imagery, et cetera, in every chapter. We, we simply need time to get through the novel. Um, so if we have a week or two weeks, if it's a long novel, um, I try to do different things on different days. Um, there might be social and cultural issues. We might talk about characterization um, through adaptation. We might look at some adaptation, pieces of adaptation. How did different directors or later novelists see these characters? Um, we might maybe read pieces of an article uh, that make a claim about a novel, you know, make make a critical claim or have a certain point of view um, and then discuss that. Often contemporary reviews can go really far. I always start Wuthering Heights with contemporary reviews because the reviewers of Wuthering Heights hated it and they said things like, I can't imagine that I live in a world where such a creature as Heathcliff would be allowed to exist and just things like that. Um, Jane Eyre had a reviewer say about it, it's a bad novel because it makes a bad man interesting. So I sometimes will pluck phrases out of reviews and say, do you think the bad man is interesting and does that make it a bad novel? So I try to use some tools to make for good conversation while we're working through it. And students aren't bored when they, once they can see how this novel works. Right. All I have to do is sort of show them the parts and that the parts are working together. And then often they'll have that reaction of, wow, I didn't even think of that. Great. We have another question. Um, and this is, uh, I'm curious about this answer myself. It says, you mentioned that you were reading a few books at a time. I've always marveled that people can read more than one book at a time. How many books are you typically reading at a time? Um, probably four. Um, Usually I'm reading a book that I'm teaching and I can't teach without rereading a book. I, I just, I don't know why. I mean, even Frankenstein, you know, I teach Frankenstein every year. Some of you know that or almost every year. And I just, I have to hold the book again and I have to at least page through it again and think about it again. Um, so I'm usually reading a book that I'm teaching. I'm usually reading a book that is um, sort of a more of a, contemporary novel that I want to get through. And that might be the book I'm moving the slowest through, depending on how, how much work I have. And then I might also be reading a critical text for research. 
And then maybe like right now, a big, a big novel. Like now I'm reading Anna Karenina. Um, so three or four usually, if that, but it doesn't work. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Read books uh, one at a time. Professor Cronin, how do you feel about, you know, the canon and being taught at the high school level? And, you know, is it more important for students, you know, at the high school level, many of whom may not be English majors, is it more important to get them a love of reading and read this young adult fiction? Or do you think there is some value still to having them read, you know, translated versions of the Canterbury Tales and Inferno and Macbeth and things like that? Um. I think that, okay, can, can I tell you um, again about these questions that English teachers get? Um, back when Oprah had her book club, um, people would say things to me, maybe you're too young to even remember that, but um, people would say things to me like, what do you think about this Oprah's book club? And, um, and then Harry Potter started coming out when my kids were little and they read the Harry Potters and people say, well, what do you think of this Harry Potter business? Right? And, and I kept saying, what do you mean? What do I think of it? Right? I mean, kids are sitting up all night long to finish a 700 page novel, right? Or people are watching TV where the richest woman in the world is talking about a novel, an important novel like Bastard Out of Carolina. I'm all for it. So I think reading, I know this is, is you know, probably the answer you expected, but reading is so important and it's how we learn. Reading words is how we learn and it's how we learn language, and it's how we learn to communicate, and it's how we learn how to put sentences together, and it's how we learn about other people. So I think that's number one. Um, the canon is full of great works, and we will all read some of them. We can't read them all. And as we said today, new writers are also reading great works. And the only thing hard about teaching the canon is that it's heartbreaking to not be able to include everything. It's heartbreaking to not include all the great things, but that's just, that is what it is, right? Um, so I do think there's value in those old things. Students love those. They like learning about what, I mean, I try to tell students, you know, the, the world didn't start when you were born, right? There are people thought great thoughts and did great things and important things before us. And we need to know what those are. Yeah, you know, we inherited a world from people, a world of art, a world of culture, a world of politics. And we need to know about that. So I do think that's valuable too. Both. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, well, I think that's it for the questions. I think there are a lot of comments out there of people that you know, had, had made some comments and recommendations for um, various authors that they like. So I, I urge everyone to take a look at those and, and uh, pick and choose. So. Yeah, I like the comments, that, the chat comments. There is so much to say about um, the civil rights movement and novels of the civil rights movement. And I, I mainly focused on books, but there's some poetry mentioned here. And of course, Langston Hughes poetry is among the best poetry ever written. So all of it, all of it's great. <laughs> and I love that I you, put out see a, you guys, you put out a little teaser there that, uh, this isn't the end. There is going to be a part two, maybe in a month or so, would you say? Dr. Yeah. Around, is that right guys in alumni? Yeah. Like probably early August. Great. So stay tuned to those emails. And, you know, the alumni office has just done a great job of putting out a variety of programs. And I think, you know, if any of you uh, watching today um, have something that you want to share with the group, you know, I definitely urge you to contact the alumni office. They'd be more than happy to set you up and you can do your own Zoom. Teach us something. We talked about a alum, a book, an alumni book group, which might be something we should sort of think about for the future. how would we do this? And maybe we maybe we could pull it off. I think we could. You. you could do it. You could do it. <laughs> I would love to do it. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank Professor you all Green. for participating. I'm so thrilled. Nice to and see you. Stay healthy. We'll look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>